Hello and welcome again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Be sure and check out my sister site, palebloomsandbeyond.wordpress.com for more written interviews. This is a video interview site that I recently started on YouTube and we hope that we'll have more interviews for you in the future. Recently, I conducted an interview with today's subject, Mark Brierly, and we ran into a little bit of technical difficulty in the recording process, so we weren't able to capture that. So we're going to try something a little different today and see how it turns out. Mark has my uh, questions, or I'm going to give those to him, and he will respond to those with a video uh, that he's recorded himself of his answers. So we hope that will work out. Um, briefly, Mark uh, Brierly, B-R-I-E-R-L-E-Y, uh, released an album in 1968 entitled Welcome to the Citadel, and some uh, have called that an album of introspective Baroque folk pop songs, and uh, that's the release that we're going to be focusing on. But also, uh, we're going to talk about Mark's uh, upbringing, his early life, uh, life before music, and um, life after music, and today, what, what's going on with him today. I think that you will find this very interesting interview, uh, as Mark is a very interesting fellow. So without further ado, I'm going to hand, whoops, hand the questions over to Mark. Here you go, Mark, and best of luck on your uh, answering and responding. Thanks, Mark, for working with me. Hi. My name is Mark Briley, Marcus Briley. Greg, my friend Greg in Texas asked to do an interview with me and unfortunately there was an accident with the recording, it went wrong. So instead of that, I'm making a few notes on my iPhone now in response to his questions and I've got his questions right here. So Greg. Let me tell you about myself. Um, I grew up in the Midlands of England, that's Birmingham, and a place called Leamington Spa, which is somewhere in Warwickshire, close to the county town of Warwick, and just a few miles away from Stratford-on-Avon. I went to the local grammar school, boys' school, and um, my main subjects and favourite subjects were languages and English, English language. I also I studied Latin, French, German, and uh, in my uh, A levels, which is the high, the highest exams in in school in grammar school, I did uh, Latin, French, and German A level. Um, while I was at school, I formed a skiffle band with some friends and played the songs of Lonnie Donegan. Um, I listened to Chuck Berry and the Everly Brothers and to Buddy Holly. Those are the kind of Elvis, those are the kind of musicians I like to listen to. When I was at school, I wrote poetry, wrote a lot of poetry. I also liked Shakespeare. I went to the Strat Stratford Theatre very many times in my childhood, in my younger days. Um, my mother was very tolerant of me wanting to do that, and I would be allowed to go and sleep out all night 
waiting for the ticket office to open the first thing the next morning so I could buy standing room only tickets for a very small amount of money and watch first nights and last nights of the season. And even later when I was a student, I worked in the theatre in Stratford in the scenic art department, uh, helping create scenery for some of the productions that featured in 1963 and 1964. Even in 1965, I still had short part-time vacation work in the theatre. Um, I learned piano from the age of about eight and carried on playing the piano until I was possibly 18 or 19 years of age. I learned classical piano. Um, I wasn't very good at reading music because I have a strange eyesight problem which makes it very difficult for me to track the notes across the page but People didn't understand that, and nor did I. Um, so I played the guitar, I played the piano. Another thing I did while I was a, a child, is I, a teenager, is I travelled. Um, I liked riding my bicycle and I biked all over the United Kingdom, staying in youth hostels when I was about 14. When I was 15, I did the same thing, riding across uh, Europe to the Rhine Valley in Germany and cycled down the Rhine Valley. Um, when I was 16, I cycled to Vienna through France, Switzerland, Austria, and back up through Germany on the way home. It took about two weeks to get there and I stayed in Vienna for two weeks and then it took about another two weeks to, to cycle back. So I was a, quite a traveller. When I was 17, I hitchhiked. And uh, one of the places I hitchhiked to was uh, Berlin in 1962. So the year after the war went up in 1962, I, um, I was in Berlin during the summer. And I went into East Berlin using Checkpoint Charlie, which was a very interesting, challenging experience. Um, well, it seemed like it to me. I was only 17. I spoke fluent German, fortunately, so um, I could converse with pretty much anybody. And that was very useful. Okay, so when I went to college, I went to a teacher training college in South London, at a place called um, Avery Hill College in Eltham. And um, my mother wanted me to be a teacher. And I didn't argue with her. It was very difficult arguing with my mother, so I tried not to. Um, but very soon after arriving, uh, I met people who were interested in poetry and interested in the poetry that I'd written at, at school. And also there were, there were people who were interested in folk, folk music and they, they had a sort of folk club. And um, I started to hear folk, folk orientated music, unaccompanied singing, you know, the sort of hand to the ear stuff, traditional songs mainly. And I started to learn a few of those and play them on the guitar very simply. I wasn't a great guitarist. I fumbled away with some arpeggios. To start with, while I was at college, I, I'd chosen to study music because of the piano playing. And I had to have an additional instrument, so I chose the guitar and for about a year I went for classical guitar lessons at a conservatoire in a place called Blackheath, which um, I enjoyed. Um, and it gave me a very formal sort of guitar playing technique, finger style technique, you know, with very 
proper handling, right hand position, and all of that stuff. Um, I can't say this was very brilliant at it, but it did help my my playing of the of the folk songs. Um, Austin John Marshall, John Marshall, John as I call him. How did I meet him? This is one of Greg's questions. Um, I was playing in the college folk club and um, the guest artist was Shirley Collins, who is a, a very well-known and is a very well-known traditional folk singer, a lovely lady. Um, and she said to me, she heard me play some songs. Um, she'd made a record with David Graham, which was inspired by John Marshall's interest in what you could call Baroque blues or folk Baroque guitar playing style, very much originated by, by David Graham in the early 1960s. And Shirley had recorded an album with him called, I think, Folk, folk Blues and Beyond. And she thought that um, her husband John would be interested in me and the kind of songs I was writing. Um, by that time also I'd started playing at a folk club in London in Liz, called Les Cousins and other folk clubs, Bungie's, um, The Troubadour and um, I was talking to people you know in those clubs who, who were regular performers there, people like John Renborn, Bert Janch. Um Anyway I went along to meet John and um, spent quite a few happy evenings and playing him songs I was writing and he said I'd like to introduce you to uh, Nat Joseph who is the boss of Transatlantic Records and uh, to see if Nat would be interested in making a record with me. Um, and so I went along to meet Nat Joseph and uh, over a space of a few months where I'd go up to his office perhaps once a week or once a fortnight and play him some new material, he came to the conclusion that I didn't have enough material for an album or a big enough following to justify spending on an album, but I could make an EP. So we picked, he picked five, five tunes from my growing repertoire that he liked I thought we'd make a good EP. Around about June, I think, of 1966, we went into a studio in central London and it was my very first ever proper recording session. So all the numbers were recorded live in a single take and um, then the record came out towards the end of that year, I think in the autumn of 1966. And it was just simply called um, Mark Briley. Um, what I became aware of during that part of the year very quickly, I was introduced to a young American called Robin Lent, who also made some records later on. Um, he was very into American West Coast bands and educated me in that area. He made me go out and buy um, uh, Jefferson Airplane and um, Grateful Dead and a few of those sort of bands and uh, I listened to them and also of course in England we have Pink Floyd who are perhaps in a similar sort of vein. I bought Pink Floyd as well and really I uh, started to very quickly get the feeling that um, I'd rather be playing that sort of music than playing simple um, guitar accompanied folky orientated songs. And through my visits to Les Cousins um, I met a young woman called Rel Grainer whose stepfather 
was Rundgrener, the composer of some very famous television theme tunes, including um, Doctor Who, which was possibly one of the best known of his tunes. And uh, Ron was extremely helpful with me, and encouraged me significantly. I was very fortunate to, to find a mentor like, like Ron Grainer. I'd already found one like John Marshall. John was interested in the folk and the guitar area of things, and Ron had got a much broader musical perspective. Um, he'd got two musicals running in the West End in London. Uh, he'd written a lot of uh, a lot of television theme tunes. He was well respected and well known. And he um, introduced me to a, a young music publisher. Let's say Jeff. He's called Jeff. Jeff. Jeff Heath, who was already, a, he had artists, he was already succeeding as a music publisher. And we agreed that um, Jeff would try to get me released from Transatlantic Records and find me a record company that would be more interested in encouraging the development of my musical interests by supporting uh, working with other musicians, larger groups, and making perhaps more ambitious, more ambitious records. So, over the course of the next 12 months, I pursued the idea of writing more ambitious material. Um, and also, uh, Jeff pursued a possibility of getting me a record deal with, with somebody, with almost anybody, as it happens. Um, there weren't that many people who were very interested in, in the kind of thing that I was doing, to be honest with you. Um, one point in uh, early 1968, I went to, I'd heard that Apple Music that was just starting out, that's the Beatles' Apple Music, not Apple, Apple, um, that if you went along to their offices in Savile Row, you could hang about and one of the Beatles would turn up and you could accost them uh, and play them your demos. Well, I did this and uh, soon after about an hour of sitting there waiting in their waiting room, Paul McCartney turned up. And he was extremely polite, extremely courteous and friendly. And he kindly listened to my one of my demos. Um, and um, I think uh, I, I rather hoped that I'd get signed to Apple as one of their, their first artists. But it didn't happen. And... Um, James Taylor got signed instead, so that was probably for the best. Um, shortly afterwards, anyway, um, Jeff managed to get me a deal with CBS Records, and um, I started working with some musicians that he introduced me to, who were essentially jazz musicians, who worked most recently with uh, John Mayle on his Blues Breakers album and Blues Breakers tour, that, what was it called? Bear Wires, the Bear Wires tour. And um, two of those men, Henry Lauder, who was a, a trumpet and flugelhorn player and violinist, and uh, Tony Reeves, who was a bass man, uh, they started rehearsing with me and we rehearsed in my my flat in Beckenham. And then eventually the day for the recording came about and Jeff picked me up at my house and my flat and we drove into London and unfortunately I had a streaming cold which wasn't a good start for making a record but Jeff got some chemicals from the local pharmacist 
and filled me up with them and I managed to get my way through seven days of recording which is all we had booked to make Welcome to the Citadel, the whole album. In those days we only had four tracks, four track machines available and um, in CBS studios. Anything bigger hadn't arrived in the UK um, but it was the arrival of the Dolby A noise, redu noise reduction system that really transformed the possibility of having more tracks on a single band of tape. But uh, anyway, so we worked away at this. It was quite hard work for me um, in, in England as opposed to recording in America. They weren't used to the idea of uh, ensemble recording, let's say, me singing and playing the guitar at the same time together with bass, drums, trumpet, whatever, in its own cubicle. The whole thing didn't happen all in one, one go. Most important to me was the inability to sing and play the guitar at the same time because basically I couldn't do it. I could either sing the songs or play something on the guitar, but not the tune that I was, I just lost my place. So I, I had to find a way of singing and playing the guitar at the same time. And eventually I got them to understand, the engineer to understand that that was an essential if we were going to make this record. And so that's what I did. And mainly things were laid down as live with overdubs from things like the, the horns, the trumpet, the flugelhorn, and overdubs from, from the cello, when we have cello part on that. Cello was played by Claire Lowther, the Henry Lowther's wife, who was a classical violinist, uh, sorry, classical cellist. Um, so, we're moving through this, the notes of this interview quite quickly and I've missed out all sorts of things that Greg wanted to ask me about, such as the individual songs on the first EP, but um, I'll leave them for now. So on the album, um, one or two songs Greg particularly asked me about, he said, Matchbox Men, were there any relation, was there any relation to pictures of Matchbox Men by the band Status Quo? And the answer to that is absolutely none. I had no idea of their, them or their record. My Matchbox Men was a, a work of fiction based on the ideas of uh, fairies and goblins arriving, you know, and smoking a lot of dope and all of that stuff all muddled up together that, you know, the, the, um, the works of J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, played an influence in the creation of that particular mystery, that fiction. Uh, Welcome to the Citadel was also, I wrote probably in 1967, in fact I did write it in 1967. Um, it was a song that inspired the cover of, the, of that album. The, the song itself became the inspiration for the painter Ron Henderson who when he heard the song said I, I know what that is I can paint that and he did all the lettering for the album cover as well and it was a, I think it was a quite a remarkable album cover at the time so I was very pleased to get it and I'm sure it's contributed to the the kind of cult popularity that Welcome to the Citadel has enjoyed in the 50 years or so between then and now. My favourite song on the record, actually if I were to have one, is called um, Time Itself. And um, it's a just a 
very sort of tender description of of that f that first winter of my marriage in the winter of 1967-68 when I was living in this big drafty room with my new wife and we had absolutely no no money at all and um, lit big log fires to keep warm and uh, got the cheapest food in, you could obtain cheapest the cheapest food available to survive on and the disappointments that are referred to promises have made us shy made us high all about the uh, ah they've got a record deal i've got a deal with so and so oh no it didn't work out all that stuff so there we go and then the encouragement to keep writing songs um, People have said to me, why do you write so many songs with the word time in it? And uh, my understanding of time is that it's the engine of the universe. It's the, it's the thing which drives every moment forward. Every event comes to pass due to the functioning of time. Life begins at the beginning of time. And life ends at the end of time and uh, time supports us when we need it to most and that I call the support of nature there's another reason as well and that's the fact that my father was a watchmaker my house was filled with the noise of clocks ticking and watches all over the place on test benches when I was a, when I was a, a child and when I was a teenager um, so maybe that's got something to do with this as well. Maybe that the, the whole nature of clockwork I find quite amazing in that the functioning of a watch or a clock uh, replicates the functioning of the universe with a crown wheel and various subsidiaries. It's just like the stars. It's quite something. Okay. Moving on. After Welcome to the Citadel, how was it received? Um, indifferently, I'd say. Um, people uh, possibly couldn't understand it. <laughs> um, and a lot of people said to me, uh, people in the business, people at CBS Records, and my publisher tentatively, who was a very patient man, said to me things like, um, have you got anything more commercial, you know, commercial, we, we, it would be good to have a hit, you know. So I tried to write more commercial songs, but I have to say it's not my forte. If I'd have succeeded, you would have heard more of me. Anyway, I wrote what I wrote, and during the, the following months, my publisher, Jeff, introduced me to Ashley Kozak, Ashley was a manager who managed Donovan. He may have mismanaged him for all I know, but um, he, man he had managed Donovan, that's for certain. And he was well known in the industry and he had produced records for Donovan. And um, Ashley took me on board as a project and um, we got together the material for a second album, which was recorded in CBS Studios in Bond Street and also in Trident Studios, which was a brand new studio in Soho that was the first studio in the UK to have eight track tape recorders, very, very important for multi-tracking. And so, um, during the course of that year, it was far less intense. It was not done on the basis of getting everything done in a week. I would go in and out of different studios uh, and record us one song or two songs. Um, I 
I enjoyed recording that very much. I, th I felt that the end quality was technically far superior to Welcome to the Citadel. Um, Hello didn't acquire such cult status, but in my opinion, there's some very good songs on it. And when later, you know, by the time I got to 2018 and decided to stop singing again or doing a, doing a gig, I was invited to do a gig. Um, most, more songs were chosen from Hello than from Welcome to the Citadel. Um, five, about five songs were chosen from Hello. And I like them. I like um, Sunny Weather, it's bright and upbeat. I like Lady of the Light, it's the story of a lifetime of marriage from start to finish. I now know. And it's quite fascinating for that reason. A presence I'm seeking. And I'm still seeking. Um, the Room, which is a companion piece to Welcome to the Citadel. It takes the whole thing just a stage further. Uh, and Hello, the song itself. I like that song. It's far more meaningful than the version we recorded, I realise. Um, it's got a lot more meat in it than... And I say that as a vegetarian. Okay, um, so that's Hello. Yes, I enjoyed recording it. We had a ball. Um, now, Greg, you want me to mention Steve Cross, my old friend, my dearest old friend, Steve Cross. We met at a folk club in Birmingham in 1970, at the end of that year, 1970, he was 18 and I was a married man. So he was a very good guitarist, he could play many things in a very, he was a very versatile instrumentalist. And we worked quite hard rehearsing on the material and uh, decided to start doing some gigs together. He'd really, he was really much cleverer than doing this. He ended up giving up music and, well not giving up music because he still plays the guitar now, but he ended up uh, going off to university, doing a BSc, an MSc and a PhD in a, a space of about three years. And um, a very clever man. So we worked together, and uh, we uh, we created some interesting arrangements. Um, but uh, anyway, that's that's that. Uh, Steve, I see regularly. We talk every week. He lives not far away from me now perhaps five or six hundred yards away and um, we cover a lot of subjects when we talk. Um, in 1973 Steve decided he didn't want to work with me anymore. He decided that uh, he wanted to do something, play play with some other friends and um, so I had to rework a solo act quite quickly and I got invited having only just really got it together suddenly invited about an hour's notice to stand in as the warmer artist for uh, the band Traffic who were playing their their first gig in Britain in some years, I don't know how many years, and they were playing in Birmingham, in Birmingham Town Hall. And I got a phone call, would I care to go and be their warm-up artist because the band that was booked had broken up on that day. So I went and did that gig and Island Records offered me a record deal as a result of it which would have been very nice, apart from the fact that they uh, withdrew it um, uh, before I actually signed the contract. Uh, the story was that Muff Winwood, 
who was the head of ANR Ireland, Stevie's older brother, um, wanted to get out of folk artists. He'd got quite a few folk artists uh, and uh, solo performers, and he wanted to get into very much more commercial music, and he had just signed Sparks. So, well, again, I don't blame him. He probably got something which was far more commercial than I would ever have been. Later that year, I did a three-month tour with Fairport Convention, their UK winter tour, autumn tour, which I loved. It was great fun to do, but it took me away from home. We had a new son, a new, our, first, our first child. Um, I felt that my wife needed me at home and I wasn't there. So, although I was happy playing and happy doing the gig, there was an element of unhappiness revolving around not being at home, not being with my wife and seeing my little baby. So at the end of 1973, I decided enough was enough and I would have to think of a new way of living. And it has to be said that We'd learnt Transcendental Meditation the previous year and that was beginning to pull us in a different direction. Um, my wife and I both became very interested in teaching Transcendental Meditation and uh, over the next couple of years we took the, the Transcendental Meditation Teachers course. Now none of this earned us any money, so I still had to earn money and I decided to pull out of the bag something I'd done really since about the age of eight or seven or eight or nine years of age, which is photography. And um, I started to use a camera again. And for some reason, completely out of the blue, I got, interest, I got introduced to a man who wanted me to do camera camera operation for shooting some industrial film, 16 millimeter camera operator. And I very quickly learned how to do that, which was <laughs> kind of quite handy because it came the key to the, the future for me. So as well as teaching transcendental meditation over the next few years, um, I also earned a living writing scripts for industrial film, industrial slideshow, audiovisual presentation, and also photographing it. So by the time of the beginning of the 1980s, I got quite a, an established portfolio of paid for, high profile, high quality industrial photography. And that enabled me to spend the really most of the rest of my working life in that area either public relations press press information packages with press release photograph um all industrial all business what you call say business to business not consumer pr um, certainly the last 15 years of my working career from uh, 2002 to 2018 was spent doing PR public relations for, in fact, civil engineering companies, all civil engineering, which took me all over the country, doing photography, working with Civil engineers writing in, writing feature articles, issuing press releases. We had an awful lot of stuff published. Week after week after week after week after week, there would be my photographs in the technical press, in the construction press. Um, so it was a very successful period of my life, which I really wound up uh, during the course of 2019 and started to think 
well, what am I going to be doing now for the rest of my life? Now I've retired. And then COVID came along. So I still don't know. I brought back into film cameras after 15 years of using digital. I've got two Leica MP cameras. I started using black and white film again, having not used black and white film since the end of the 1970s. Um, soon as we can start travelling, going away to places, going to Italy, then I'm going to hopefully start taking some nice pictures that people might be interested in, create some portfolios of interesting content. We'll see. Um, but I think it's absolutely certain I'm not going to be playing the guitar again. Okay, I think that's all I have to say. And so thank you very much for listening, if you were listening. And uh, take care and enjoy the future.